James loved diving and especially the gear needed for it. He liked tinkering with new gear and checking out catalogs and displays at the local dive shop. His friends oftentimes suspected the whole reason he pursued cave diving is to play with the tech gear that level of diving required. On dives, he liked to carry extra equipment like multiple tanks and regulators. His friends often heard him say, there isn't a problem in a cave that an extra regulator cannot fix. Though James' only problem was that he never spent time planning or reviewing how to use all his equipment in a life or death situation. One time, he was cave diving and saw a group of divers using underwater scooters. He had never used one before, but after seeing how cool and effortless the dive those divers were making, he decided to buy one himself. He told his friends how cool the other divers looked soaring through the water. So as soon as James' new underwater scooter was delivered, he charged its battery and planned a cave dive. Two of his dive buddies agreed to join, but neither of them had scooters. While James would use his scooter, they said they'll do a standard progression through the cave system which they had done many times before. The cave was relatively shallow. It only dropped below 50 feet deep, but what it lacked in depth, it made up in breadth. The cave system sprawled underground through the limestone for miles, branching off in every direction like veins in a leaf. Divers had explored this cave system for years, marking routes and laying in permanent guidelines, but many of the branches from the main tunnel remained unmarked. It's kinda like a maze, easy to get lost. So James planned to cruise ahead of his two buddies with the scooter following the permanent guideline installed through the main passageways of the system. He said he would return to them after a few minutes, allowing them to use the scooter as well. So with that plan in mind, the trio entered the water. They felt pretty relaxed making jokes at the expense of each other. James was excited about his scooter. He played around in the open area of the spring for several minutes, getting a good feel of his new toy and how it responded. After turning some loops underwater, he was ready to begin the dive. James cruised through the open water where the flow of the water pushing out of the spring is the greatest while his body struggled against the water's force. This underwater scooter was a game changer. James was having the time of his life. However, in his excitement to use this new toy, James didn't realize he left his friends behind almost immediately. After some time, he had already sailed through multiple passageways. James released the trigger on the scooter and hovered in the water for a minute. Since he didn't have any experience diving with the scooter, he wasn't completely sure what he was doing. The scooter was slightly negatively buoyant and it began to pull him toward the cave's silty bottom. James added air to his buoyancy compensator and clipped the scooter to an open D-ring. So he managed to make himself positively buoyant so that he floated up to the ceiling. He wanted to float close to the ceiling because he didn't want to cause a silt out by stirring up all the silt in the bottom which will also obscure his exit. Once the scooter was stabilized, James looked around and checked out his surroundings. He shined his light around and saw the elegant rock formations around him. He was in a chamber and it was unfamiliar to him. And only then he realized that he had never penetrated this far into the cave before. Literally nothing there even vaguely familiar to him. To make matters worse, he realized he had spent too long inside the cave when he checked his dive computer. It had been 20 minutes since he entered the cave, far longer than he had planned. His next big concern was air, but luckily, when he checked his pressure gauge, he saw he still had plenty of air in the tanks. As James was having an incredible effortless ride with the scooter, he became careless. He let the scooter do all the work only to end up in this chamber. James scanned the room again. It was only about 10 feet high but seemed to go on forever, at least beyond the range of his dive light in either direction. Now he was in the center of this room and, and after a while, he couldn't even tell from which direction he had entered this chamber. 
he checked the floor of the cave with his light to see whether the permanent line was there. Because normally, when divers first map a cave, they place directional arrows on the line to indicate the way back to the main line and the surface. Basically with it, James can find his way back out of the cave but to his bad luck, there was no line. Which could only mean that he was the first human ever to get to this chamber and no one else has explored or mapped this area of the cave. James was lost in this maze-like cave system now. He didn't know which way he should head to find the way out before his air runs out. When he realized he is in grave danger, he began to panic. And from there onwards, what really happened to James was unclear. He was supposed to return back to his dive buddies after several minutes. But after waiting for some time, his buddies realized something must have gone wrong. The last time they saw James was when they all entered the cave. So the two friends then quickly surfaced and decided to wait a bit more. But then when they waited beyond when James' air supply should have been exhausted and still saw no sign of their friend, they alerted the authorities. A local dive team immediately arrived at the cave's mouth and entered the spring to search for James. The search took way longer than they had anticipated. Probably because the chamber James was in was in the middle of nowhere inside the cave. Rescue divers had to go much deeper and farther into the cave to eventually find James' body. Yeah, he had passed away by that point. When they found James, he still had air in his tank. It was a bizarre finding because everybody presumed he must have run out of air. According to the investigation, it was theorized that when James realized that he was lost and had no hopes of finding a way out, he panicked. He panicked a lot, which then led him to hyperventilate and pass out. Once he was unconscious, his regulator slipped from his mouth and then he drowned. That was the best explanation as to how he must have died. James made more than one fatal mistake beside the obvious one which is not having enough training. He didn't have a proper plan and also he didn't know how to properly use an underwater scooter especially in a very dangerous cave system. He therefore suffered an unfortunate fate that he could have easily avoided with better planning and preparation. Joanne was a comfortable and competent diver. She was not highly trained in the sport, but she had enough experience to go diving safely. She had learned to dive with her husband William on a vacation. Since then, every year they dove together on a trip. Over 7 years, she had made about 60 dives all in warm and clear environments with good visibility. William on the other hand, was a bit more experienced in diving. He dove not only with Joanne but also with his buddies from the local dive shop in the local lake. Joanne prioritized safety a lot. She liked to dive in warm, tropical and clear waters. For her, diving was just part of taking a vacation. So diving in a cold lake with murky water was never her thing. But when William asked her to join him at the local lake, she just couldn't say no. She ran out of excuses and couldn't keep up with William's persistence to convince her to join him. So eventually, she agreed. Thrilled with the news, William was very considerate and rented Joanne a thick wetsuit so she wouldn't get cold in the water. For him, diving was one of the most fun activities. He loved to dive any chance he got. So he was super duper excited to get into the water, but this time, it was clear that his excitement was mostly coming from his wife joining him on the dive. Despite Joanne's reluctance and doubts, there was no way she could back out now. In fact, now even she herself felt a bit excited about the dive, seeing how happy William was. So just like that, the day of the dive came. Joanne and William arrived at the lake early and took their time getting ready. This was Joanne's first ever dive in the fresh water. With thicker wetsuits than what they were accustomed to, they realized they had to do a buoyancy check first. That means checking how much extra weight they would need to carry with them in order to stay in the water without floating. This is why divers use weight belts. 
so they estimated the amount of weight they would need and then entered the water to test it out. Both were able to sink pretty quickly, so they decided their weights were fine. During this whole time, Joanne was feeling pretty uncomfortable. Beside her and William, more people were there diving in the lake. They already had stared up the silt in the water and therefore the visibility where Joanne and William entered the water was very low. When Joanne put her face in the water, she was stunned by the frigid water and dismayed that she couldn't see the bottom only a few feet below her fins. Joanne then attempted to back out of the dive, but not with William. He convinced her to continue. They made a plan to descend to 30 feet and follow the contour of the lake until they get to the turning point caused either by low air or cold and then ascend to 15 feet for the return trip to the exit. So they eventually began the dive. Joanne was getting used to the water. She started to feel more relaxed and less tense. She didn't necessarily like the dive but signaled to William that she was doing alright. She descended slightly below William for a moment when she saw something shiny in the rocks below. Then, all of a sudden, something caught hold of her regulator. This caught her off guard. She forcefully pulled against whatever had caught her. Then the regulator pulled out of her mouth and she swallowed a mouthful of water. All this was happening within a matter of seconds. Frantically, she started signaling for William. Luckily, he was only a few feet away and slightly above her. She signaled that she was out of air and he quickly gave her his extra air supply. Yet she continued to panic and choke, struggling and fighting to get to the surface, but she couldn't rise. She was floating in place fighting for her life. Seeing this nightmare, William felt horrified, but he was quick to take actions. He inflated Joanne's low pressure inflator hoping to get her to the surface. This seemed to work. She slowly started ascending but only slightly. All this only made her panic even more. She got worse every second and with it now even William began panicking. Neither could understand what the problem was. Just when William thought it couldn't get any worse, Joanne knocked William's weight belt loose and it fell to the bottom. William all of a sudden began to float toward the surface away from Joanne. The worst possible thing that could have happened just happened. When William was floating away from Joanne, he also took the extra air source he gave Joanne with him. He just had it. He never would have thought he would lose his weight belt. William desperately fought to swim back down to Joanne with everything he had, but he couldn't. Without his weight belt, he couldn't swim back down. Like a scene from a movie, the distance between Joanne and William slowly increased. Right before William's eyes, Joanne struggled and struggled until she passed away. It all happened so fast. When her body was recovered, rescue divers found her primary regulator entangled in a rope caught up in the rocks on the bottom which can explain how the regulator was pulled away from her mouth. Moreover, when William tried to inflate Joanne's points to compensate her, hoping it would help her ascend to the surface, it made it even more impossible for her to freely swim in the water. She basically became stuck in place like a balloon at the end of a string. Their weight belts were also too heavy. When they tested it before the dive, yeah, they worked, but only to descend, but when it comes to the ascent, they were too heavy. On top of all that, they also panicked. They panicked a lot. Therefore, finally, it all led the two to a painful fate, a one big disaster. Joanne died and William had to see it all without being able to do anything about it.